morning, everybody. It's Regina. Welcome to our session on peer support. We're so pleased to have three people speak to us this morning about a systems perspective on peer support and lived experience. So a warm welcome to you all. Just a reminder of our team, a thanks to Jordan Clark for his technology support. A, a thanks to Chris here from Vancouver Coastal Health today who really helped us do some last minute setup. Thank you very much for, for Chris for his help. Uh, to Matthew Lang, as always, for his uh, unfailing support with technology. Without him, as usual, we wouldn't be here. And to Dr. John Higginbottom, whose brainchild this advanced practice uh, website is. So thanks to John this morning. And myself, Regina, who you hear from often. So uh, a big welcome to you this morning. You'll remember that our purpose of advanced practice is really to support clinicians, man managers, and people responsible for providing, providing PSR services by tr transferring evidence-based knowledge, providing expert clinical consultation, providing training and education, like today's event, uh, and developing website resources. We also hope to support the Provincial Advisory Committee and the uh, Community of Psychosocial Rehabilitation Partners. So that's really our purpose. And just a note to the wise, our next webinar will be about engaging and supporting wellness, and that's scheduled for November 18th, 10.30 in the morning, so we hope to see you here. And as ever, uh, the cost is free. So I mentioned the topic of today, and to make sure that you're in the right webinar and the right space is about peer services and recovery-oriented psychosocial rehabilitation practice. And so it is my great joy to introduce to you our three presenters today. The first person uh, who will speak is dear Renee Mohammed. Um, and Renee is the program coordinator for the peer support program at Vancouver Mental Health and Addiction Services, a part of Vancouver Coastal Health. And that is where we're located today, hence all the change in technology um, last minute change. So that's Renee, and Renee will speak um, first. And the second person to speak is Sue McDonald. And Sue is the coordinator of consumer involvement and initiatives for Vancouver Community Mental Health Services and Addiction uh, for Vancouver Coastal Health. And so Sue and Renee will share the first part of the presentation. And then we will hear from dear Sonia, who will provide a lived experience of peer support. And Sonia comes to us as a peer support worker um, with Vancouver Coastal Health and is trained in wellness recovery action planning and trained intervention many of you are familiar with. So with all that, I will uh, now hand you over to Renee to begin. And so I'm just gonna switch to the lecture mode. Please remember, I know usually we have a visual, we have a camera, so your system is working. We just don't have the camera uh, in operation today. So um, just bear with us for that. So. Um, here's Renee, who will start the presentation. Thank you. Great. So I'm I'm really pleased to be doing this. And um, just so you all know, this is a new experience for all of us, all three presenters. We have never done a webinar before, so I hope you can have some patience for us. But we are really excited to be here. So um, what you're seeing right now is, uh, is the logo for the peer support program for Vancouver Mental Health and Addiction, that nice circle in the center of the slide. Um, it was developed by one of our peer support workers, Anna Goretzis, and she wrote about what the image means to her. So she writes, I decided to create a logo symbolizing peer support and recovery using the image of two individuals about to embark upon a path. Since recovery is a challenge and often hard work, the path leads all the way up a mountain. A peer support worker can help one navigate the way and, as a peer, is also learning from the experience. Peer support workers, by their dedicated labor, are role models providing hope that one can climb the tall mountains of life's challenges one sure step at a time. Okay, and I'm just going to get it to switch over to the next slide. Okay, 
So um, the things we're going to talk about today is going to be what is peer support, national strategy, Vancouver programs, and the voice of lived experience. So what is peer support? Um, the, the slide here comes from the Peer Support Accreditation and Certification Canada's National Certification Handbook. Peer support is based on a relationship between people who have a lived experience in common. In the case of peer support in our context, the experience that individuals or groups have in common is in relation to a mental health challenge or illness. This common experience might be relative to one's own mental health or that of a loved one. So the peer support can be to people struggling or who have experienced a mental health issue and also family and friends who care for someone who is experiencing a mental health issue. We wanted to include a little bit about the history of peer support and I really want to give credit to the site here, that appears at the top here. Um, a Brief History of Peer Support Origins by Patrick Tang, and there is a website there. That's where we got our information about history, so I really want to draw your attention to that site, and we also took the image from that site. So uh, modern organized peer support owes its success in part to the mental health consumer movement in the 1970s. This movement empowered formal mental health service users to help each other and to advocate for themselves. From these roots, peer support grew to find new applications in chronic disease management, such as diabetes, mental health, heart disease, cancer, asthma, HIV, AIDS, substance abuse, as well as screening and prevention in, uh, in cancer, HIV, AIDS, and infectious diseases, also uh, in maternal and child health. Peer support is gaining recognition in almost every sector of health and health care. It is an emerging force. Um, and where did it all start? Larry Davidson, professor of psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine, tracks the beginnings of peer support to a psychiatric hospital in the late 18th century France. And the image you see on the slide is a picture of that hospital. The governor of Bicetry Hospital in Paris, Jean-Baptiste Poussin recognized the value of employing recovered patients as hospital staff. The chief physician at the hospital, Philippe Pinal, praised these peer staff for being gentle, honest, and human. He said that they are adverse from active cruelty and that they are disposed to kindness. Hiring formal patient, former patients marked a shift in the philosophy of mental health care that ushered in the moral treatment era. Poussin wasn't alone in hiring peers. Davidson found peer staff appearing in a number of other inpatient settings also. Peer support surfaced again in 1965 through the work of Robert Karkoff and Charles Truo, uh, who had lay counselors trained with specific skills to help mentally ill patients in hospital settings with success. Professionals in community mental health were often among the first to advocate for the integration of peers into primary care settings. In 1967, Emery Cowan proposed a model of community mental health care that requires the employment of non-professional peers in the development, implementation, and evaluation of community interventions. Still, the mental health profession, profession in general was slow in its uptake of peer support, but the idea of peer support was rapidly and widely adopted by the community of mental health consumers. The mental health consumer survivor movement has been a driving force behind the dissemination, adoption, popularization, and growth of peer support. In the 1970s, big state hospitals across the country were being closed down, releasing patients with severe mental illnesses into the community with inadequate transitional support. At the same time, patients began to speak out about the systematic mistreatment and denial of civil liberties while under the care of state mental health hospitals. Once released, former patients sought relief through autonomous peer and mutual support groups, which helped empower individuals as well as the community. In its most radical period, 
the mental health consumer movement sought autonomy and rejected traditional modes of care. In the 1980s, there was a shift as the movement reached out to governmental and professional organizations. This period of re-engagement led to improved mental health care practices, increased funding for technical assistance and training programs, and a subsequent boom in peer support service. In the US, peer support specialists in mental health were among the first to be certified and qualify for state and Medicaid reimbursement. What about Canada? So locally, the Mental Health Commission of Canada launched its report, Making the Case for Peer Support, in 2010. And it was a document that highlighted the importance of peer support services. Then in May 2012, Peer Support Accreditation Certification Canada, or PSAC, was launched as an independent organization, completely separate from the Mental Health Commission of Canada, to continue the work aimed at accomplishing the following four key goals. So the first was to establish national standards of practice for peer support. The second uh, was to establish national certification of peer support workers on a voluntary base. Third was to establish evidence-based research data showing the efficacy of peer support. And fourth was to establish accreditation of training programs meeting the knowledge standard requirements. Peer Support Accreditation and Certification Canada's work is still underway, although they have piloted the certification of peer support workers in Nova Scotia. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Sue McDonald, who will be talking about what the research says about peer support. So thank you, Renee. So what does the science tell us about peer support? This quote I've chosen is from Peers for Progress, uh, the same site that Renee pulled upon for the history and the lovely picture of the asylum. Um, this program was founded in 2006 to promote peer support as a key part of health, healthcare, and prevention around the world. Their mission is to accelerate the availability of best practices in peer support. Peers for Progress is designed to demonstrate the value of peer support, extend the evidence-based for such interventions, help establish peer support as an accepted core component of healthcare, and to promote peer support programs and networks on a global scale. They found that much evidence supports peer support as a critical and effective strategy for ongoing healthcare and sustained behavior change for people with chronic diseases and other conditions and that its benefits can be extended to community, organizational, and societal level. Overall, studies they reviewed have found that peer or social support decreases morbidity and mortality rates, increases life expectancy, increases knowledge of a disease, improves self-efficacy, improves self-reported health status, and self-care skills, including medication adherence. It also reduces the use of emergency services. Additionally, providers of social support report less depression, heightened self-esteem and self-efficacy, and an improved quality of life. And closer to home, as Renee noted earlier, the Mental Health Commission of Canada echoed these findings in their landmark report, Making the Case for Peer Support. And now I'd like to tell you a bit about what they found out about programs in Canada. So making the case for peer support also mapped out peer support in Canada. They found that types of peer support provision varied widely, but that the most common forms were self-help groups and one-to-one -one support. So self-help groups are run by volunteers where consumers support each other. The key here is mutuality and equality. Next, we have peer-run organizations with consumers running formal services, staffed and governed by consumers and survivors. Equality is highly valued. People accessing these programs are likely members. In the next variation, we have peer programs in mainstream organizations where the primary control for the program is with peer providers, but is shared with non-consumers. 
our peer programs here are examples of this. The peer support workers see clients of our teams and other units, but we do not control access to the program or other aspects of the bigger picture. Peer programs of this nature are also gaining attention in other settings. The armed forces in particular are looking at peer support to help address occupational mental health issues. The last level of peer support outlined on your screen is where individual workers or contractors are hired by an overall mainstream organization to provide peer support with no formal program in place per se. This is much rarer in instance, but mentioned here to align with the making the case for peer support document. Personally, I am not familiar with any local examples. As for how peer support is done, and as mentioned before, peer support can occur among a group of people or in a one-to-one -one setting. In either case, the peer supporter provides emotional and social support to others who share a common experience based on the philosophy of peer support. They're just giving me more volume. <laughs> so uh, Mark Reagans of the Village in California talks about this philosophy as a recovery-oriented, person-centered approach focusing on the relational, relational aspect of service, supporting individuals to achieve quality of life goals based on hopes, dreams, and desires. Peer support workers have a leg up in this regard, each equipped to draw upon a personal journey of improved health and wellness, the lived experience of the one who has been there. It has also been shown that families derive a similar sense of connection with others who share the common experience of being a supporter. I believe that all of us drawn are drawn to people who share similar circumstances or characteristics with people who just get us. Given this philosophy and the types of peer support programs in Canada, I'd now like to focus a bit more on peer support here in BC. Ooh, you moved my mouse. Okay. Now I'd like to talk about peer support in BC. So in 2001, the BC Ministry of Health published a peer support manual incorporating information about peer support programs in our province. The first of its kind in BC, the manual is still referenced today and is cited in the soon to be published BC Psychosocial Rehabilitation Service Framework. In the manual, peer support programs are defined by two factors, the nature of the support and the structure of the program. Starting at the top, mutual support and formal structure. Um, this type of program has no formal training for peers. The focus is on mutual aid and companionship. Everyone involved is a volunteer. In trained peer support moderate structure, programs of this nature feature a trained facilitator and a basic structure. Think about, peer, think about support groups that are run with a facilitator. In trained peer support, a formal structure, uh, this type of program provides screening, support, and coordination of the peer support workers. Finally, the trained peer support complementary to clinical team formal structure, um, similar to the previous category with the trained peer support formal structure, but with a few distinctions. The peers complete a practical placement as part of their training, and they subsequently work from a mental health team or unit. Staff members at sites provide supervision. And more recently, on a very local note, we were heartened to see mention of peer support in the recently released Mayor's Task Force Report on Mental Health and Addiction. <clears throat> in Caring for All, Priority Actions to Address Mental Health and Addiction Phase Run Report, published just last month, the number two action area calls for a peer-informed system, emphasizing having the right faces in the right places. And priority Section number five includes work to support and enhance peer support, mentoring, and service navigation. The report also states that although more evidence-based research on the topic of peer roles in healthcare is needed, local examples of peer practice show positive results. People with lived experience have clear and central roles in the recovery of others. Peers are trained and professionally valued in formal and informal healthcare 
housing and support environments. Pretty powerful stuff. And now I will pass you back to Renee, who will discuss the benefits of peer support. Thank you, Sue. So um, I'd like to talk about the image that you're looking at right now. Um, it's a, I think they call them wordles, word graph. Um, it's an image, it's a set of words that were generated by peer support training grads and guests from the class, the celebration for the class of 2012 and 13. So they're all graduating and they were asked to uh, write words on flip chart paper that represented peer support for them or that resonated for them when they thought about peer support. And it's kind of interesting because I think it speaks to some of the benefits of peer support. So you'll see here words that include inspire, hope, compassion, support, and empowerment. And then um, the year before, our grads and guests at peer support training graduation did the same activity, came up with words that represented peer support for them. And again, there's a lot of similar themes like hope, transforming, empathy, understanding, possibilities, value, relatable, and breakthrough. So that's what our grads and guests had to say about peer support. We also look at uh, the Mental Health Commission of Canada's document making the case for peer support. Uh, there's an interesting quote that says, we found that the development of personal resourcefulness and self-belief, which is the foundation of peer support, can only improve people's lives that can also reduce the use of mental health, uh, medical and social services. By doing so, peer support can save money. So um, I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, the peer support program that I am involved in, which is the one-to-one -one peer support program for Vancouver Mental Health and Addiction Services, which, as we noted earlier, is a part of Vancouver Coastal Health. So this program is an example of the trained peer support comp complementary to a clinical team formal structure classification identified by Psychosocial Rehabilitation BC. Our peer support workers have formal training and are contracted in paid positions to work as a part of a mental health team. We started by training 10 peer support workers who were placed at six mental health teams and units back in 1997 when our program was getting started. We now have them at 17 sites and there are over 75 contracts in our system held by 49 individuals. A typical contract is 20 hours a month, but I really want to point out that there is variation in that. So we are seeing some contracts with more hours, as well as some with fewer hours. Um, the program is peer-led, so it's coordinated by a person with lived experience of mental illness, myself, who reports to the Consumer Involvement and Initiatives Coordinator, again, a person with lived experience of mental illness. We offer formal training to those with lived experience receiving mental health services that qualifies them to apply for paid work providing support to others living with mental health issues. Now this image here that you're looking at was created by one of the graduates of our peer support training who went on to become one of our peer support workers. His name is Bryn Dittmars and he was creating an image that represented peer support to him. He also wrote about the image, and I'll, I'll tell you what he says about this image. So this is Bryn Dittmars. I believe that this image reflects my personal experience as a peer support worker. The bouquet of flowers at the bottom of the image symbolizes the vast variety and diversity among the many people affected by mental illness these days. There are carnations, lilies, and tulips of many shapes, sizes, and colors. The two figures on either side are simply two of these flowers, whose characters have been discerned from amidst, amidst the masses, engaging in peer relations. What I believe peer support work does is celebrate the individuality of the client by soaring through all the flowers and pulling one out to highlight that person's strength. Thus, the long stem rose, emerging gallantly and beautifully 
from among the many others, perchance to be recognized by his or her virtuous traits. So um, on that note, and, and on along the theme of recognizing virtuous traits, peer support workers in our peer support program provide strength-based one-to-one support to others, uh, supporting them in attaining goals, acquiring new skills, and linking with community resources. And I really want to em emphasize the strength-based approach that they try and use. Um, I was asked to give you some examples of the kinds of things that they do. And really, it can be almost anything. Um, the, the ideal goal for peer support is a goal that comes from the person receiving peer support services. And so it can be very diverse. So um, examples of things that peer support workers have helped with um, include uh, attending a weaving class with someone who had too much anxiety to go to the weaving class on their own, um, meeting with someone to give them an opportunity to practice conversation skills, uh, a bus training, teaching people bus routes and helping them to be more comfortable at using transit. Um, we had uh, we have some peer support workers working with uh, people who for whom English is a second language, so they're providing some support around learning English. Um, there's there's just a whole range. Oh, we had a peer support worker uh, whose client their their goal was to join a rock band, and so the peer support worker was able to connect them with a local group that met in a garage and played music and he joined the band. Another peer, one, I'll give you one more example and then I'll stop because I'm on a roll here. <laughs> um, another peer support worker, um, the, the peer's goal was to expand his social circle. So the peer support worker went with him to a pool playing club and supported him in going um, and the person was hoping to meet other people at that club and, and actually did successfully form a friendship with someone at the pool playing club. So it can be a whole range of things. So uh, recovery. Those receiving peer support services benefit from personalized one-to-one -one support from someone who is walking the walk of recovery themselves. And that makes a whole, it put a, puts a whole different lens on things. People are often in a position to inspire because they're walking that walk of recovery and they have a different kind of expertise than other sorts of workers have. Um, the system benefits from the opportunity for other mental health workers to work alongside people who are open about their mental illness as colleagues. And that can result in system practices being better informed by lived experience. Those who work as peer support workers also report that the program makes a difference to them. So this is the actual peer support workers um, saying that it helps them to move forward in their own personal recovery and sometimes to reframe past struggles as assets. So those challenges that people go through become qualifications for the role, the work of peer support, and become things that people can draw on in their work. So training. Our training consists of 105 hours of classroom time and covers a range of topics. So it includes introduction to peer support, recovery, self-disclosure, communication skills, understanding mental illness, addictions, goal setting and empowerment, psychosocial rehabilitation, grief and loss, ethics and boundaries, recreation and leisure, conflict and understanding, suicide intervention, trauma-informed care, advocacy, cultural competence, community resources, smoking cessation, supporting volunteers, working with specific populations, whew, and more. Um, there's, there's really a lot in our training. And then the classroom portion of the training is followed by a practicum, which is 36 hours long, where people get to take those pieces from the training and put them into action. Um, in terms of the classroom part of the training, some sessions are presented by the peer support program coordinator, and many others are taught by service providers chosen because they have expertise in a particular area. And one benefit of that approach is it really raises the profile of peer support within the system when we involve the whole system in the training of our peer support workers. 
Um, class sessions are supplemented by readings from the Recovery Support Workbook by Ann Ryder. For the last three years, we've had between 75 and 85 of people, people apply for 25 seats. So there's a lot of people who want to get into peer support. And our group has included students from specialty programs such as the Deaf Wellbeing Program. I'm going to talk just briefly about a research project we did related to our peer support training. Um, so last year, we hired a peer researcher, Seema Shaw, to design and conduct surveys with our peer support training alumni who graduated between 2007 and 2012. Of the potential 104 survey respondents, almost half, 47, completed the survey. And I will say that our researcher has said that it wasn't that she was getting a lot of people saying no. It was more that um, our contact lists for some of the graduates were quite lit, were quite old. You know, we were going back to 2007. And so in some cases, the contact information was no longer current. Um, but we did get, you know, almost half of completing the survey. A few key statistics that she found were that 65% of people who took the training reported working as a peer support worker post-training. 78% reported doing some type of paid mental health work, peer support, or other post-training. And 89% reported that the peer support training added to their personal recovery journey. So the training was really created to prepare people for a vocational goal, to work. Um, but we're finding also that it moves for people forward in their recovery. Um, just going to give you a couple of quotes from, uh, from the research. Um, one peer support training alumni says, it gave me hope, I'm sorry, it gave me faith and hope to move further on my journey. I look back and found that I am not, I'm now onward striving forward to a more successful stage and it all resulted from having the peer support training. Another uh, peer support training alumnus said, the energy I received from the peer support worker training program has been useful in everything, not just finding work, but also in the way I approach things now. I'm much more engaged in what I do. I feel there is hope for the future, and I'm enjoying my life a lot more than I was when I was in those years of unemployment and depression. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Sue McDonald, who is going to speak about some other forms of peer support in Vancouver. So um, I'm going to see if I can get the mic working a bit louder now. So um, examples of other peer-run initiatives in our service in Vancouver include peer-facilitated workshops and our aptly named Consumer Initiative Fund program. First, I'd like to tell you about our peer-led workshops. Okay, so the most recent addition to our peer facilitated workshops, peer led workshops, is talking with your doctor and other healthcare professionals. Talk with your doc was developed by William Godolphin and Angela Toll of the University of British Columbia's Division of Healthcare Communication, and they're both longtime advocates of patient shared care. This brief workshop gives participants an insider's look at a medical appointment with the model patient and practitioners making most of their intera their interactions. So we're finding the appetite for this particular workshop. Um, people are very eager to learn more about how to make the most of their medical appointments, and staff are really charged at the idea of people becoming more empowered. Probably the, our most well-known course is RAM. So developed by Mary Ellen Copeland, the Wellness Recovery Action Plan, or RAP, is an evidence-based practice that is used worldwide by people who are dealing with mental health challenges as well as other mental medical conditions. The RAP has seven components taught in separate sessions. The sections are wellness toolbox, daily maintenance plan, triggers, early warning signs, when things are breaking down, crisis plan, and post-crisis plan. 
And don't worry about writing all that down because we've included a link to the mentalhealthrecovery.com website where there are loads of information about RAP itself. In fact, new evidence has also been published relating the benefits of combining RAP with one-to-one -one peer support. We think this makes a lot of sense for anyone. A staple course which we've offered for many years is Bridges, just coming up on your screen. Building recovery of individual dreams and goals through education and support, or Bridges, consists of three separate components. The Bridges course itself um, has material that is spread over 10 sessions and lays each session itself lays the groundwork for the next session. The Bridges Support Group is an ongoing group open to anyone who has a mental health diagnosis, whether they have attended a Bridges group or not. And Bridges Footsteps gets its own slide. <laughs> the Footsteps workshops are a more compact version of the Bridges material. The classes are shorter and topics covered can be understood as standalone sessions. Recent research on Bridges conducted by Cook, Stigman et al in 2012, concluded that peer-run mental illness education is effective in improving participants' perceptions of recovery and hopefulness. I know we're sold on it. Another Canadian workshop we are proud to deliver is Your Recovery Journey. Just coming up. So developed by the Schizophrenia Society of Canada, your Recovery Journey is a five-week program delivered using a multimedia and question and answer format. The goal of the program is to increase participants' ability to meet their personally defined recovery goals by enhancing their self-determination and quality of life. As you can see, we're committed to offering a variety of ways to promote recovery. In addition to our workshops, we offer regular opportunities for folks to come together to revisit or discover some key concepts in a safe, supported environment. So on your screen, you see an example of a couple of our support groups. Um, our drop-in support groups help extend the learning opportunities to previous class participants and others. And our Hearing Voices support groups, now in their second year, have been very well received, connecting peers who receive services with peers who might not be connected to us in any formal way. All are very empowered. The third capacity building program we run is the Consumer Initiative Fund. Sorry, getting a little bit of a dry month there. Um, and don't seem to have that slide. Oh. So the Consumer Initiative Fund is a fund that sponsors projects proposed, managed, and run by people with lived experience with mental illness or addiction who live in Vancouver. On your screen, you're going to see our spotlight on mentalhealth.com website. Um, it's the hub of our enterprise, and we really try and pull together information about our, all our programs and services, as well as information we think will be of value to our community. Um, we have some other social media activities that are led by our program leaders and also inviting people to engage with us. All of that information can be found at our spotlightonmentalhealth.com website. So the fund itself has a number of standing projects that run from year to year. The Unexpected Circumstances Grant, Art Supplies Grant, Education and Leisure Fund. Just ignore the program website there. Uh, these funds give out money to people for a variety of reasons. Um, they've been peer vetted, uh, peer reviewed, and in the past year, between the funds and the other projects, which I'm going to refer to later, um, we've served over 500 individuals. So um, getting really good bang for our buck with these programs. So uh, the projects that are peer led and peer conceived and peer run um, that are intended to build capacity in our community uh, for 2014-2015 are, as you can see on our screen, so it ranges everything from a uh, social, social group for people living in a specific part of Vancouver right through to a theater class where people get an opportunity to practice theater skills um, and improv and clowning in a safe environment 
uh, in that particular class, there's no actual production, nothing done in public, but it's skill building for individuals who want to improve themselves in a way that's fun. And last but not least, uh, I'm hoping last but not least, I'd like to talk about peer staff positions. So Renee's talked a lot about our peer support workers, but I'd also like to draw your attention to the fact that we also have peer employee roles here at the Health Authority. So I, I will just mention the peer support worker positions I was speaking about were contract positions. Oh, yeah. sorry, thank you, Renee. As I scramble for the note that I have, that was lovely. Okay, so many of these positions, so the employee positions, are held by individuals who started out by taking peer support training, ours or other programs, and worked in contract positions. We're excited about developments in other regions and beyond as well that will help inform our work. Uh, the use of peer support workers in an in Ontario emergency department um, is a very intriguing practice that we've just found out about. Stay tuned for more at a hospital near you. In fact, a guest editorial in the Journal of Psychosocial Nursing and Mental Health Services sums it up well. Collaborators, not competitors. Peer workers and professionals. The evidence for peer support is persuasive. And now, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Sonia Graham, who's going to tell us, in her own words, about peer support from both sides of the experience. Over to you, Sonia. <clears throat> Thank you, Sue. Today I'm going to share a portion of my personal journey. A few years ago, my life fell apart and so did I. My job of 10 plus years was extremely stressful and I started to have panic attacks. My anxiety had grown to a point where I had to take stress leave. At work, I was no longer considered reliable. I lost my job and the depression set in. To add to this, I had to give up my apartment, discard most of my belongings, and my 16-year-old cat passed away. With no money and nowhere to go, my parents took me in. I don't remember much of that year. But I knew I needed to do something. I needed help. I needed answers. I needed to reach out. And I've been turned up in volume. Okay. I turned to my family doctor. I turned to my family doctor, I turned to my family, and then my doctor, and then others in mental health. My mom took me to my doctor's. He assessed me, put me on a combination of medications, and referred me to other treatments. I was supposed to join a cognitive behavioral therapy group, but I couldn't commit to it because I had a huge issue with the bus. Now, let me explain that issue. I get on the bus and grab a seat, no problem. But others would also get on and suit up counted in. With that, my anxiety would go through the roof. I wouldn't be able to breathe and walk the bus up the road. I did, however, find a local job club. There I was assigned a case manager. She was terrific. She helped me apply for disability income, get on a low-income housing list, and she introduced me to a peer support worker. My peer support worker made a huge impact on me and my life. She has her own lived experience, so she understood me in a way that my family and my clinical team could not. My peer support worker was so patient, so positive, and such a great support. With her help, 
I conquered my fear of riding buses. You see, she started by riding the bus with me. After a few times, she then had me get on alone, and she'd join me a few stops later. Eventually, many months later, she'd be meeting me across town. All the while, she listened to my fears. She explained things that she had done to reduce her anxiety like focusing on anything but all the people on the bus, and breathing, just breathing. She also cheered me on every step of the way. We continued to ride the bus, and I started group therapy. After several groups, from cognitive behavioral therapy to RAP, I decided to try schooling, and I took a college prep course. My peer support worker continued to meet with me weekly. She'd help me with my homework, we'd talk about the fears I had, and the next steps I would take in my life's journey. I used the course, and we then said our goodbyes. Realizing that I was capable of learning and no longer having a fear of riding the bus, I started my career training. I started with obtaining my certificate as a RAP facilitator. Then I took the required training to become a certified peer support worker. I've also done some volunteer work and expanded my knowledge of resources for my peers and myself. To add to that, I've done some small projects to fight the stigma and made some awesome friends. Now it's my time, my turn, to give back. I'm supporting others in one-to-one -one settings as well as in peer-led groups. I'm using my experiences and my knowledge and training to encourage others to attain their own successes. I love working in this field. It's the greatest feeling to witness others conquering their demons and moving on with their lives. Well, thank you for listening to my story. I hope it was inspiring and leaves you with something to think about. All right, so everyone, we're going to just um, take a minute now. We've got a little bit of time left, and uh, I think the presenters are open to, to some different questions. So if, uh, if folks want to take a few minutes, think of any questions you have about the presentation, type them in. Um, and, and while you're doing that, I just want to uh, extend a huge thank you to Renee, to Sue, to Sonia for the trouble of putting this presentation together, for finding all the information, and for sharing their stories. So thank you very much. We'll just take a couple minutes and wait for questions, and then we'll uh, we'll see what comes through. And it's Regina. I just want to echo um, our thanks from PSR uh, Advanced Practice. Thank you sincerely for your time, your effort, and the heart that you put into this presentation. I feel deeply moved um, at the other side of this table, and I'm sure for many of you who are far away, it had resounding impact as well. And really, this. Um, presentation, we got a little bit of a uh, impetus from people in the interior of BC saying that we don't have uh, a lot of peer support services and please can you think about doing a webinar. So we're very grateful. We know these good people work ever so hard and this is off the side of their desk. So we're very grateful for your time and your energy and your kindness in doing this. Yeah, we've got several questions coming in. Um, So from Doug, um, what are oops, uh, what are some accessible resources for getting peer support programs started in one's organization? So I guess that's further to that point of that we don't have peer support everywhere, and sometimes I think we live in a city and we sort of forget that. So I'm just looking at Renee, or um, I, I don't know if somebody feels like they have something to say. What so was the, the question? question is, what are some accessible resources for getting peer support programs started in one's organization? Well, there's a lot of information about <clears throat> RAP available on the internet, and that can be run, in, we run that as a peer run, as a peer run workshop. If you go to uh, mentalhealthrecovery.com, there's some information on that. They'll train facilitators who can come back. Um, and uh, facilitate that group. So that's one form of peer support, and the whole package is all laid out for that group. So, 
And maybe Renee just further to that, Alex asks about the, uh, specific resources you can direct to us to uh, when we want to refer people uh, to become RAP facilitator or peer support worker. The www.mentalhealthrecovery.com website for RAP. Um, and uh, mental health peer support worker, if there's a training in your area, I would refer them to that. If there's not, I would look at starting one. Ours started um, as a part of the um, mental health authority, uh, the, the health authority, as part of Vancouver Coastal Health. And when they were getting it started, uh, they identified what, what they wanted the role of the peer support worker to be. So in our system, it's providing one-to-one -one support, helping their peers attain goals. They identified what they wanted to have covered in the training, and then they enlisted all the expertise that's in the system from all the different staff who work in the system to come and present those topics. And they also created a coordinator position who coordinates the whole thing and teaches some of the classes. And then also I would really encourage you, if you're looking at starting up a peer support training, to go to the Peer Support Accreditation and Certification Canada website because they are in the process of developing standards uh, which will, um, when they're implemented, will allow people to be certified as peer support workers. It's an unfortunate word to use in mental health, but have per peer support <laughs> certification. And, uh, and that certification will be recognized nationally across the country. Sue has something so to add? I, I'd like to add to it. Um, so that's about our program specifically, funded by the health authority. So we've been very lucky that we've had money set aside and grandfathered for this purpose. Um, we're also aware of some other programs in our community who um, have received funding from a number of sources. So uh, the nonprofits out there, you're really resourceful. <clears throat> um, so a number of the programs are, I guess, priority areas that have been identified by the nonprofit organizations. Um, as Renee was saying, it doesn't take much to get it going, and then uh, it's up to the organization and the people involved to really steer the program in the direction that your organization or community wants it to be. Thanks, Sue. Um, I was just going to say um, with RAP, uh, you must take the RAP group first and begin living your RAP experience before you can take the actual facilitator training. So I was going to add to that. But. And you can work on it online. Like if, if RAP is new to your community and so you don't have any RAP groups that people can attend, if you go to that website, you can take RAP online and then through um, the Copeland Center, be matched up with somebody who can offer the facilitator training to you. Thank you all for your thoughtful responses. Um, so many questions coming in. I'm doing my best to keep on top of them. Surely, maybe the next question. Uh, wonders about contrasting uh, your recovery journey with RAP. Your recovery journey was developed by the Schizophrenia Society of Canada, and it has a bit of a different focus. Uh, it talks a lot about recovery. Um, I haven't been involved in it for quite a long time, so I'm not remembering all the details. Uh, but what I can tell you about RAP is um, RAP is about, really it's about creating the life you want to live. It's about developing an action plan for your own wellness and, and being all you can be. And it has particular components, uh, wellness tools, identifying your triggers and your warning signs, coming up with actions plans for dealing with those things, uh, looking at identifying what it looks like when things are breaking down, uh, coming up with action plans for doing with, dealing with that, developing a crisis plan just in case that comes up for you, um, and a post-crisis plan for when you come out of that. So it, it's very much about developing self-care plans, whereas uh, your recovery journey is, is looking more broadly at the notion of recovery. Do, do you guys have things you want to add? So from a program management point of view, um, we have a lot of flexibility with running the Your Recovery Journey. Um, less, it's less um, documented um, with uh, 
and, and not being an evidence-based practice, we have some leeway. It's also a shorter number of sessions. And so from a purely financial point of view, um, our ability to run those courses uh, takes less funding from, from our program budget to run the Your Recovery Journey. But we really are committed to running uh, a combination of courses. We found it's very useful in, in our communities, so in the different parts of our city even, to uh, run a number of courses back to back so that people have different options. We also find that once people get into a rhythm of attending a group, making some friends, uh, being a part of a community, that they really want to extend that experience and are really happy to take the next thing we have to offer. I can say I've taken a lot of different groups and I will continue to take those. Um, you have to keep up to date with what's going on and you're still living your own experience and these groups really do help me um, wrap for me, put things in order and help me learn about myself and what I can do to even up the bumps in my life so that I can contribute to my own life. Um, and group like Boulder's Cognitive Behavioral Therapy has taught me how to deal with my anxiety, which gave me the basically tools to start this. Um, there's so many different groups uh, learning how to eat right, how to, how to sleep properly, how to meet people. You just really have to check out what's out there. Thanks, everybody, for great feedback. I just want to come to one patient person, and I know you guys are probably tired because that's a long session, mm -hmm. but I do want to just maybe have a moment to. Uh, respond to this uh, Shirley who speaks about CMHA organization so in Northern Ontario so very nice to have you all the way from Northern Ontario uh, we wave at you um, and you're just saying that you want peer support to be an essential component of the service you offer moving towards um, what seems to be a unique approach in a formal service system we're working hard to uh, to having at least 50 percent oh my word every time I oh so sorry the uh, screen just slipped away on me as I was, um, yeah, so, oh, dear, 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 so sorry, the joys of technology here. It ran away, Matt, help, I bet you will. Ah, oh, thanks so much. So 50% of all staff um, in positions qualified to offer peer support. Would appreciate your perspective on the benefits or the challenges your presenters see in this approach that we're taking. Oh. So Sue obviously is fired up to respond to this. Surely, <laughs> surely I'm extremely excited to hear what you're doing in your area. Um, and it reminds me of a quote from a researcher in London, Mike Slade, who said that um, to be truly evidence-based, um, our services really need to be overrun with peer support workers. So, <laughs> Oh, what a great Good on you. Good on you. That's exciting. So I think that's a big thumbs up, um, Shirley. So, yeah. We have a couple other questions, sort of more logistic questions. Um, one from Chris Sutherland around resources for promoting your support programs. Is there anywhere that folks can go to get that? As well, there's a second question from Jacqueline. Um, around uh, the accreditation of peer support workers and how that fits. Are formally trained and accredited workers paid differently? What is the salary? So the accreditation is new and it hasn't really been rolled out. It's been piloted in Nova Scotia, uh, but it's not available to us here yet in BC. So I think it's a bit early to say that whether it's going to change pay rates for peer support workers. It, it's only been piloted in Nova Scotia. So this, it's very much in the early days in development. It would be nice if it led to um, higher pay rates um, to recognize that additional um, uh, certification. And then there was a second quest part of the... Oh, oh, yeah, promotional resources. Well, the internet is amazing. Um, you know, you can have a website featuring all your different programs. Uh, I think one of my colleagues has put a calendar up on our website where it shows when all the groups are being offered on a calendar. Uh, we promote through uh, social media, so we have an, uh, an e-list. It started out as an, a, mic a Microsoft um, distribution list through Outlook, and we've moved it over to MailChimp, so we promote all our programs through the, the MailChimp e-list. We promote them on Twitter. We have a Facebook page. Um, we, we do flyers. We print out 
printed flyers and we send them out to all the mental health teams put up in the waiting rooms. What else do we do? Word of mouth. Word of mouth. <laughs> we just uh, produced uh, some beautiful, beautiful colored brochures. Yes, yes, and and a nice poster. So for our, we, I forgot about this because they just came out, but. <laughs> For our one-to-one -one peer support program, and we have them for the other programs too. We've we've got posters, and we got brochures, and the brochures for the peer support program are going to be kind of useful because um, they'll be a tool that our peer support workers can have when they go to meet with their client for the first time. They'll have this brochure that can help them to explain what their role is. So it's a tool, but it's also a brochure geared toward um, clients who might be interested in asking for a peer support worker. So they're going to be in the waiting rooms at the different. How can people access those promotional tools? If somebody wants to get a copy of the poster, we have a limited number of posters. But if uh, I think we have enough to send a few out, if someone wants a copy, or we could send you an electronic version. Yeah. So if you were to email uh, Sue or myself, uh, we could certainly send you the electronic version of both the poster and the brochure. Um, I have one more. Just while Matt's finding that last question, just thanks, Jim, for your comment uh, around uh, forensic psychiatric services and just your statement that you're impressed with the outcome of this approach. So that was our intention, and so really nice that you're thinking about it within the forensic context. So thank you. Mm -hmm. our, our, our last question, I'm not sure if we'll be able to address directly because folks might not have experience, but does anyone know of peer support services being delivered um, remotely via telehealth in the north? Oh. Not specifically, but I have recently read an article about the efficacy of peer support being delivered online. So something similar.